It's great to have you here. Sorry about the little confusion there with the shuttles. Um, today and this morning, we've got two land talks. So like after all that ocean and atmosphere work we did yesterday and we're going crossing out into the land, uh, we have Dave Lawrence for the first talk. And so Dave has been a long time uh, proponent and sort of champion for the land and being able to be one of the, the co-chairs for the land and looking for the biogeochemistry. He's actually involved in the uh, CTSM project. He's sort of like the lead on that. Another, uh, another, uh, quite a number of other really sort of main focuses for land. So I might turn it over to Dave so we can get through and get the process going. But, uh, and I'll let Dave introduce himself. Um, thanks, Dave. Okay, great. <laughs> thanks, Peter. Um, assuming everything is fine, you can hear me? Uh, which uh, is perfect. <clears throat> you see everything? Good, all right. So yeah, so uh, apologies for not being able to be there. I wanted to be there in person, but I got COVID last week and I'm um, still in quarantine though, feeling better. Although my voice is still a little bit, a little bit weird. So hopefully I get through this lecture. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the land model uh, within CSM and you know, focusing on the, the biogeophysics aspect, but really an introduction to, to why we care about the land and the, and the earth system as much as anything. Um, Throughout the presentation, uh, you'll see me sort of talk about CLM, the community land model, and also I'll refer to it as the community terrestrial systems model, um, CTSM, which is which is the way we're moving. It's a unification of the of climate and weather uh, modeling across NCAR. And so I use these synonymously throughout the presentation. So for, for your purposes, that you can think of them as the same thing. Okay, so I'd like to start the presentations on land with this question about land modeling and and why this is a photo of my my wife, and uh, she's an oceanographer, and we like to have these conversations in the kitchen about our science. And uh, she'll say, uh, you know, since she's an oceanographer, are you sure this is really necessary to be working on the land? Uh, obviously, facetious. Um, and so I like to answer her with yes, of course. And you know, there's many reasons, but principally, land uh, is a critical interface through which humanity affects and is affected by, adapts to and mitigates global environmental change. So absolutely critical if you're trying to understand how climate change, climate variability is going to affect humans and ecosystems on Earth. <clears throat> but some more details, you know, land modeling, why, um, land atmosphere interactions, you know, going back for many, many years now, one of the principal questions with land modeling has been what happens if you have, you know, long, mostly wet soils after a rain event, um, you know, does that lead, if you get changes in fluxes at the surface, does that lead to uh, changes of precipitation? So that's a, it's a big folk, folk area of people who are interested in land atmosphere interactions. Um, you know, when, where, and by how much do land fluxes influence the atmosphere, surface temperature, clouds, precipitation, et cetera? There's also questions, you know, more in the weather and the seasonal prediction world about land drift and predictability. And is there um, skill coming from the land model? And, People have found uh, over the years that there is significant skill, especially when conditioned on the amplitude of the initial solar or anomaly. So especially when the land is, is anomalous, uh, that tends tend to impart quite a bit of skill in, in uh, you know, weather to seasonal predictions. There's also evidence that there's uh, going to be increased land and atmosphere coupling in a future warmer climate. Um, the land and the atmosphere will be more tightly coupled because more uh, the system will be more commonly in what we call the uh, moisture limited regime. Um, and this may actually lead to an increased land-driven skill uh, in the future is something that's an open research question. And the land has also a lot of influence on extremes. Uh, dry conditions tend to lead to larger extremes and vice versa. Um, in terms of water, uh, why do we care? Well, land has significant feedbacks on drought and floods. That is well known, um, but exactly how those feedbacks play out uh, remains an open area of research. There's a the snow albedo and the snow soil temperature feedback you know, we know that snow cover is decreasing around the world, uh, and that uh, exerts an impact on the overall climate system. Um, much like when sea ice decreases, there's a, there's an impact on the overall climate system as you get more energy being absorbed by the uh, by the surface and then re-imparted to the atmosphere. There's obviously major questions about water and food security. Um, more than a sixth of the world population depending on water from seasonal snowpacks, and so understanding water security under climate change is actually critically important for humanity. And there are there is evidence already that there are trends in, in when runoff is happening. It's happening earlier uh, in most places across the Western US and many places around the world. 
which has implications for, for things like irrigation. There's water plant interactions. Um, we know that plants are likely to more efficiently use water with an increase in CO2, and this has uh, implications for water availability. Um, we may actually be getting some benefit from increased CO2, uh, which might mitigate against some of the other climate change impact, impacts on water availability. And then there's stream flow prediction is another big area of research. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering why in terms of land cover change. Well, almost 25% of the non-ice land areas under on anthropogenic land cover change, like deforestation, like in this image, to uh, generate cropland or pastureland uh, to grow food. Um, but it's really actually worse than that, or depending on what you call it, worse, but more impactful than that, because about 80% of the non-ice land area is under some form of land management. And the figure on the right shows, uh, the upper figure shows the human footprint where humans have impacted the land surface. And what you see wherever it's basically green, um, anywhere it's not blue, uh, is where humans have, have had a strong impact on the land surface. And you can see this pretty much everywhere except for the, the Arctic, the deserts, and the center of the um, Amazon rainforest. <clears throat> Regionally, uh, land use and land cover changes has been impactful as surface climate on surface climate as, as greenhouse gases. We've seen definitely in previous studies that in certain places, uh, you know, the impact from greenhouse gases on surface climate uh, it can be very large, um, and that's going to be important as we move out in the future and try to use the land to uh, mitigate against climate change through naturally based uh, solutions. Climate solutions. Um, irrigation has been shown that it can mitigate heat extremes, for example, and have a strong impact on heat extremes. About a third of the direct historic carbon emissions, uh, somewhat surprisingly, sometimes if you haven't thought about this, are actually coming from land use. Um, 180 petagrams. Um, this is a little bit of a little slide now, but um, compared to about 400 petagrams from fossil fuel and, and cement production. So most of that was happening you know, early in the, in the 20th century, um, but it persists to today, and about, about a tenth of the total emissions are coming from, from land use change today. Uh, deforestation in particular is, is important for the global carbon budget because uh, forests tend to be good, um, uh, have a large capacity to, to accumulate carbon, but if you deforest, then you're losing that, that what we call the additional sink capacity and yields an indirect on the, on the, on the carbon and therefore the climate and the atmosphere. Um, there's big questions about the effectiveness of afforestation or reforestation and biofuels for CO2 mitigation. And we use land models to sort of probe that. And then finally, there's urban and rural differences in climate change impacts. Um, for example, heat stress in, in the urban environment um, is really important for, for you know, cause that's where most of the people live. And we are finding that urban areas are warming faster than, than the rest of the world. And then finally, uh, land modeling why carbon and ecology. The carbon and nitrogen cycle interactions their impact on the long-term trajectory of the terrestrial carbon sink are, uh, are one of the most important uh, aspects of, of land models and why we are using them and developing them. Um, whether or not that the land continues to be an effective carbon sink is, is going to determine how much CO of the CO2 that we emit uh, stays in the atmosphere. There's a large uncertainty in this projected sink. Um, in emissions-driven simulations, uh, we find that the uh, uncertainty due to the land carbon sink is, is leading to about plus or minus 1.2 degrees Celsius of uncer uncertainty on top of about 3.7 degrees Celsius of projected change. So it's you know it's on order of, of, a, of a quarter to 30 percent of the total uncertainty is uh, is coming from this land carbon sink. Uh, there's big questions about the vulnerability of ecosystems to climate change, as well as natural and human disturbances. Um, you know, the, how much ecosystems will provide in the future in terms of food and, sorry, in terms of wood production, in terms of uh, habitat uh, diversity maintenance. Um, and then there's questions about how we can manage these ecosystems to try to mitigate against climate change. So to answer all these, you know, myriad questions that we're trying to address through land models within our system models, um, there's been a ton of evolution of land models over the decades. So if you go back into the 70s and even back into maybe the early in the late 60s, um, the land component was really just expected to produce surface energy fluxes back to the atmosphere <clears throat> with very simple models um, with treating very few of the actual processes going on land. Um, and as we've evolved, we've started representing uh, plant canopies, um, how, how plants are, are using water through uh, concepts to model resistance, uh, representing soil moisture more explicitly and accounting for the heterogeneity of the land surface. 
moving into the into the late 90s and the 2000s, we started treating dynamic vegetation, uh, calculating the global carbon cycle, um, treating lakes, rivers, and wetlands uh, with some degree of fidelity and including gra groundwater into the system. And then finally, in, in, the, in the tens and moving now into the into the future, we are accounting for things like nutrients, land cover change, crops and irrigation, uh, urban and, and lateral flow processes, lateral water flow processes in soil. And of course, throughout this entire sequence, um, all of these aspects have been continually developed uh, through time. So that you know, we started working on dynamic vegetation in the in the in the two thousands, and now we are evolving to a next generation of dynamic vegetation models called ecosystem demography models, which you'll hear more about, I think, later today. So starting off as land as a lower boundary condition of the atmosphere in the early, early days, now treating land as an integral component of the Earth's system. So that brings us to today um, and what CLM looks like, CLM5, which is the version uh, that's part of the CSM2 um, that you've been hearing about. Uh, the latest version of CLM, although we have uh, a CLM 5.1 now that's uh, essentially available to the community with some, um, you know, significant but but not big changes. So this is what it looks like. You know, the, the land model has a, it's very complex as is every aspect of the year system. Um, we're trying to do a lot of things. Every arrow on here indicates a flux um, that we are trying to represent, which may involve you know, a lot of research uh, behind each one of these fluxes. And that's on the top, all the fluxes and, 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 and states that we're trying to model. And the bottom is an indication of, of sort of more of the landscape scale processes that we're trying to capture, like river um, water flow, uh, land use change, uh, vegetation dynamics, and then treating different aspects of the surface, like glaciers and lakes and urban and wetlands. Um, put in their words, um, we can break it down a little bit further and say, well, what is the role of a land model within an Earth system model? And fundamentally, it is to simulate those fluxes that I showed on the previous page, um, to simulate the exchanges of momentum, um, energy, water vapor, CO2, dust, and other trace gases and materials between the land surface and the overlying atmosphere, and the routing of runoff to the ocean, and at some point, um, the routing of, of things like nutrients or carbon or sediment or temperature. <clears throat> um, and to do that, we need to be able to prognose the land states. And the states in the model are, are things like soil moisture, um, and whether it's liquid or, or ice, uh, soil temperature, canopy temperature, snow water equivalent, carbon and nitrogen stocks and vegetation in the soil. So fundamentally, we need uh, to be able to calculate all these things. And so if we focus in on you know, the, the surface energy balance of the model, um, you know, the responsibility of the model is to calculate the uh, surface energy balance, which is, you know, calculating how much of the incident solar radiation is reflected back to space, that's the albedo, and that's controlled by many properties of the land, including the vegetation and the soils and uh, snow on the ground and, the, and the, what the snow texture looks like, snow grain size. Um, obviously, we need to calculate the upwelling long wave, um, which is again affected by the vegetation and the soil and the snow. Um, and that is all balanced there. That, that's the net net radiation is balanced by the <coughs> excuse me, echoing uh, latent heat flux and the sensible heat flux, and, and going into the surface, the ground heat flux G. <coughs> In terms of the water balance, um, you are accounting for precipitation that is incident on the, on, onto the onto the land, and that uh, precipitation will be uh, intercepted. And stored as either as either snow or or liquid water on the vegetation. Uh, that water will then through uh, some of it will will drip down through. Some of it will will fall straight to the surface. Uh, at the surface, we need to account for how much of the water is in, infiltrates into the soil. How much goes directly to the surface runoff. Um, uh, obviously, accounting for all the snow processes, which are which are mitigating all these things. Within the soil, we need to calculate the vertical just uh, movement of water in the soil, um, and whether or not it's going to, uh, you know, get into the into the water table, um, and then where depending on where that water table position is, that affects the subsurface runoff. And so, and then that obviously can be storage of water uh, on, in the in the land. You know, the the uh, water and energy and uh, and um, runoff fluxes are are all you know, integrally linked. And that's one of the big challenges of land modeling. And, and sort of a, a famous scientist within our field, Randy Koster, uh, 
made this statement many, many years ago, um, but it still holds true today, is that you know, the ability of a land scheme to model evaporation correctly depends crucially on its ability to model runoff correctly, and vice versa. The two fluxes are intricately linked through soil moisture. And I think it's interesting to, to think about that. They're both nonlinear relationships, which are, of course, then difficult to model, um, and where we spend a lot of our time and effort trying to improve these, uh, these curves. Um, what you see is that, you know, if you look at, uh, say, the blue curve evaporation and soil wetness is the x-axis there, um, if you go from very dry soils, uh, there will be no evaporation, right? That makes sense. And as you go to wetter soils, there's usually a rapid increase uh, in, in evaporation, which then will tail off and sort of saturate at some point um, as you get to wetter and wetter soils. And essentially, the, the atmospheric demand becomes a controlling factor. But runoff behaves sort of differently. Uh, at very, very dry soils, there tends to be uh, more runoff because the soils are hydrophobic, a feature that we actually don't capture very well in our model. Um, and then you get to a, you know, say a medium soil wetness level is when this runoff would be the least. Water is all being sucked up by the soils, and then it starts to rise as you go uh, up higher and higher to soil wetness, and that continues to sort of rise and would go up to, you know, in like 100% uh, of the incoming precipitation as you got to completely saturated soils. <clears throat> and then finally, there's the uh, carbon exchange and trying to capture uh, how carbon and, and nutrients, uh, how they sort of affect that carbon exchange on land. And that's another big feature. And you'll be hearing more about that in the next lecture. So land is in every aspect of the, of the earth system is complex. And, and CLM is made up of a lot of different submodels. Um, on the biogeophysics side, there's photosynthesis and somatic resistance models. There's the hydrology scheme. There's snow models. There's soil thermodynamics. There's uh, the radiative transfer, which affects the uh, surface, uh, is, which is controlled by surface albedo uh, and radiative flushes through the canopy. On the biogeochemistry side, there's, there's representation of carbon and nitrogen pools, vegetation phenology, which is basically when veg leaves come on and come off during the, during the annual cycle. There's soil decomposition processes, there's plant mortality, uh, nitrogen cycle, and methane production emission. And then there's a, lot, a bunch of other models that sort of control more of the landscape scale dynamics, um, including vegetation dynamics, um, or ecosystem demography, our latest version, urban model, crops and irrigation, lakes, glaciers and ice sheets, fire and fire emissions, dust emissions, river flow, and biogenic volatile organic compound emissions. And so, you know, I've always sort of looked at this a little bit differently to the, to the say, the atmosphere of the ocean model is um, the land is, is uh, a lot of little or smaller features that all need to be represented and put together um, and less controlled by something like dynamics, or more controlled by a large number of competing uh, interacting fluxes and states. And so this is just an example of, of, of the complexity. This is the land model complexity, the snow, snow model example. I'm not going to go through all the different submodels of the of CLM because that would take too long. But I like to use a snow model as an example of just to sort of capture, you know, the kinds of things that we're thinking about within each one of these submodels. And so the current snow model has up to 10 layers of, of varying thickness um, that will grow and decay as the, as the snowpack uh, evolves over the winter. And then the processes we're representing, obviously accumulation, uh, and you need to know the fresh snow density of that of that new snow, which is a function of temperature and wind. Um, there's snow melt and refreezing, which affects the snowpack properties, uh, the density, which affects the snow thermal heat transfer. There's snow aging, which affects the albedo of snow. There's water and energy transfer across snow layers. We treat snow compaction in three different methods, uh, ways that uh, snow can compact. We account for sublimation. We account for aerosol deposition onto snow, which affects, again, the al albedo of snow, how bright the snow is, that uh, black carbon and dust uh, falling under snow tends to darken the snow and it makes it absorb more energy. We account for canopy snow storage and unloading. We account for canopy snow radiation and we account for snow burial vegetation. So short vegetation like grasses and shrubs can get completely buried by, by the snow, which again then affects the albedo. And then also within a grid cell, you need to know how much of that grid cell is covered by snow. And so we have primarization to cover, that represents snow cover fraction. <clears throat> So even with all these processes represented, it's still missing things that we, we know are important. Uh, blowing snow is not represented, but we know, especially in places like the Arctic, where there's a lot of high winds, um, that blowing snow really makes, it, makes a difference. 
Um, there's also a subgrid variation in the snow depths. We don't account for that. We just treat uh, the grid cells having a single snow depth. And then there's depth lore. That's that's a very uh, sort of grainy snow. It tends to form at the bottom of the snowpack, especially in the Arctic. And, and I was just reviewing a paper yesterday uh, basically complaining about how CLN doesn't represent depth lore um, and how that's you know, having a big negative uh, impact on things like uh, soil temperature in the Arctic. And I completely agree with them. Uh, it's just a hard process to represent in, in a model of this class or actually any, any snow model. So, you know, I, I kind of like to go through this set of examples about how plants interact with climate because fundamentally, um, a lot of what we do in, in the modeling, uh, land modeling world is trying to understand how plants and climate interact. And so let's think about that. How do plants and climate interact? Well, there's many different ways through short wave, long wave sensible heat and latent heat flux and latent heat processes. So obviously uh, plants have uh, affect the total amount of sunlight that is absorbed by the surface through the LPO. And I'm sure this is obvious to all of you, but I'll just state this for the obvious fact is that different plants have different color essentially, and then therefore are absorbing different amounts. And this is a nice image from, from uh, I think, some boring Alaska where the, you can see the dark colors here, the, the, the needle leaf trees are quite dark. And then trees that are more like, I'm not sure exactly what kind of trees these are, but um, you know, deciduous trees are, are brighter. And of course that would have a diff, uh, different impact on, on the, how much energy is absorbed. Um, so that's that's order one by plants. Plants also uh, play an important role in the long wave budget, uh, mainly through how they affect the CO2 in the atmosphere, which is obviously a, a heat trapping gas, um, and also the water vapor. So plants uh, you know, evaporate and transpire water into the atmosphere. And that is a H2O is a water is a greenhouse gas and therefore is affecting the, the surface temperature. Plants also affect um, you know, the near surface climate through, through uh, its interaction with the sense of the heat flux. And that is really controlled uh, strongly by the, by the roughness. So we, we know that um, you know, different sizes, different heights of, of vegetation is going to have a different impact on the turbulent exchange with the atmosphere because of its roughness. And so a shorter uh, vegetation or grasses are, are gonna be less rough and therefore imparting less turbulent uh, fluxes into the atmosphere than, than a taller than a taller tree. Similarly, a, a rainforest, which might look actually relatively uh, laminar from, from, from the atmosphere's point of view, uh, would have a different impact than, than a savanna, where there might be sort of a, a few trees here and there uh, followed by grasses. So that really has a strong impact on, on the sensible heat flux into the atmosphere. And then finally, uh, evaporation and transpiration is, uh, is really important. Obviously, uh, plants are mediating uh, the water cycle on land. And, you know, the key thing here is the transpiration uh, flux of water, uh, which we calculate that uh, occurs through the leaves and, and is controlled by, by stomates, um, which are uh, features of plants that are open and closing, that they open to, to bring in CO2 uh, for, for growth. Um, but as they're opening, they lose water um, through the transpiration, which we call transpiration, and you know that's the way that plants are, are using water to, to, to grow. Um, and we know there's a lot of controls on, on the CO2 exchange and the transpiration. Um, it's a function of many things like solar radiation, humidity, deficit in the atmosphere, uh, soil moisture, so integrating very tightly with the, with the hydrologic cycle. <clears throat> the CO2 concentration is important. The more CO2 in the atmosphere, the smaller those stomates uh, can open, which is the water use efficiency effect. Um, temperature and also the leaf nitrogen content um, all affect uh, the fluxes of carbon in and water out of the system. So, you know, with all those things taken together, uh, we know then that a change in plants, so you get a change in distribution, or if you get plants dying off or growing better, um, that's going to change the surface energy budget. And so that's a big feature of the research that we do. And in fact, if you sort of synthesize across our current understanding, um, of what we know about the system, we can sort of say, based on these sort of different ways that fluxes are controlled uh, by plants, we can say, no, the forest ecosystems, not all forest ecosystems have the same impact on climate. Um, tropical forests uh, accumulate a lot of CO2. They're, they're very, they're, um, you know, they're growing very, very healthily. Uh, there's a lot of sunlight. Um, and so they're good accumulators of CO2. 
Um, and they also have relatively strong evaporative cooling. And so on average, they're, they're a, a cooling influence on, on, on climate. Whereas in temperate rainforests, sorry, temperate forests, um, they're pretty good CO2 absorbers with moderate evaporative cooling, it's a little bit more uh, mixed. Um, and then in the, in the Arctic, the boreal region, the, there are moderate CO2 absorption. There's not as much sunlight, it's colder temperatures, so they're not accumulating as much CO2. And they also have weak evaporative cooling. And also there's things like the snow albedo feedback, whereas a snow falls on a, on a forested region tends to have a lower albedo than, than on an on a open grassland or tundra. And so if we think about these, you know, we might think about that, that um, tropical forests are planetary saviors. Uh, they're doing a great job of cooling the climate. Uh, in the temperate regions, it's a bit more unclear. And then in the high latitudes, um, for a forest, we sort of jokingly can say that they're a menace to society. There's no need to promote conservation. Um, that's obviously in jest. There's lots of reasons why we want to maintain our boreal forests. Um, but if you're thinking about where to reforest, you may consider not reforesting or outforesting in, in the high latitudes to, to accumulate carbon due to the declining impacts. Okay, so. <clears throat> A few challenges that we go through, I'd like to introduce the concept of land modeling challenges and especially land surface heterogeneity. So just three images here that just indicate sort of the intense heterogeneity that we can see on the surface. There's agriculture, there's lakes, there's glaciers, there's uh, forests, there's um, rivers, there's tundra, there's different features on the land surface that are hard to capture. And so we try to capture those through uh, the concept of, you know, treating land surface heterogeneity through a tiling concept, subgrid tiling. So we take a grid cell that might look like the image up there. We split the land model into, into five different land units currently. Um, the first is naturally vegetated. Um, the second is lake. Uh, the third is urban, and there's different uh, density classes for urban. Um, the fourth is glacier, and the fifth is, is crops. And so then within each one of these different land unit types, we have different maybe subclasses underneath them. So within, within the vegetated land unit, we have uh, soil underneath it and several different plant functional types can coexist on on any one of those on any one of those soil columns. Um, and there's currently about 15 different uh, plant functional types in the model. Um, more if you consider all the different crop types, which I won't be talking about today. And so we're trying to you know capture the broad differences in plant behavior and plant interaction with the climate by by, by um, you know separately treating each one of these plant functional types um, based on their on the way that they interact with the system, their properties like their, their uh, reflective properties and their water usability and their how much carbon they accumulate and things like that. And then within the urban, there's different uh, features in the urban within the glacier. We treat different elevation classes to account for the strong uh, um, gradients and, and elevation across many of the, gla of the glacier regions like in the Greenland or, uh, or Antarctica. And then with crops, we treat um, uh, separately irrigated and unirrigated parts of the crop, and each different crop exists on its own column to more where we don't think crops are really competing for resources like they are on the, on the naturally vegetated column, where we assume that plants are competing for resources like water and, and nutrients. And so within a grid cell, then we, we use uh, MODIS data and other data sources to try to figure out the weights of each one of these different land unit types. Uh, for each grid cell around the earth. And so this is just a hypothetical uh, grid cell that might have you know, some fraction of lakes, some fraction of glaciers, some fraction of urban, and then different fractions of various uh, land unit types. And then the arrows on here indicate what we call loud transitions, where we uh, <clears throat> allow the, the area change to occur. And in fact, we've just updated this, so the urban transition is now allowed as well. And so we allow the, the weights to change through time to account for things like land cover change. Further on, uh, this, this sort of structure allows us to model uh, different features of, of the system sort of independently and, and with a fair amount of detail. So in particular, we are interested in how land management is affecting uh, the carbon and water and nutrient cycles. And so within CLM on the, on the crop land unit, we are now include within CLM5 a global representation of crops with eight basic crop, crop types listed there on the right, um, accounting for things like planting and grain fill and harvest. Um, part of those uh, areas is irrigated and we account for that, which is an important uh, forcing in the climate system essentially. Um, we account for industrial fertilization, which is turns out to be quite important uh, in, the, in the global carbon balance. Um, we account for things like wood harvest, 
we know that humans are going in and taking wood off the land, and that's affecting uh, the functioning of, of the forest. We account for urban environments, which allows us to look at urban heat island effects, essentially. And we also account for anthropogenic fire ignition and suppression. So that land unit structure allows us to sort of treat these things in, in, in more detail um, and allows us to sort of treat landscape scale dynamics. Like I mentioned, each one of these uh, arrows indicates an allowed transition, which we tend to specify by input data sets. And, and here's an example of how we do that. So here's an example of, for example, that the things we're trying to capture on, on the land surface in terms of land use change, a big feature of, of research in our, in our group and, and land modeling in general. Um, so we will get data on land cover change from, from an external data set put together by, um, by colleagues who are involved in the Earth System Modeling Endeavor. And so this might be what a grid cell looks like uh, you know, at one year. And then the next year you say that there's been some deforestation to create more, um, more agricultural land. And so basically what we do is we update our weights and then account for all the energy and uh, water um, conservations that we need to do. And then going forward, then we would model this grid cell um, with this set of weights, um, which would then give you a different uh, you know, simulation of the surface uh, climate and carbon and water and energy and nutrients. Okay, um, in the interest of time, so I have time for questions, I think I'm gonna kind of skip over this other example of, of land service heterogeneity uh, related to soil moisture. Um, Except I do want to mention just very briefly that a new feature that is becoming in the model uh, over the next several years is, is this concept of representative hill slopes, or sorry, it is in the model now and is, will become available to the community uh, shortly, um, which is kind of for the fact that there's lateral movement of water uh, or controls on, on uh, base due to uh, um, aspects have pretty important controls on, on vegetation behavior and functioning. And so this is what a seal on grid cell would look like. And you can say if you went from a standard grid cell as one by one and increased the evolution by a factor of, of nine, um, you see that you haven't really changed that. All these new grid cells look basically the same. So instead of doing going to high resolution, what we're doing is trying to use this concept and say, well, let's try to model this hill slope here uh, with a large degree of fidelity rather than trying to go into really high resolution, which you would have to go to to capture what's going on along that grid cell. Good so, and so accounting for the lateral flow of water, and also the um, uh, what you're getting in terms of the um, incident radiation uh, that's coming from slope and aspect uh, considerations, and also the downscaling of, of uh, precipitation and temperature uh, into into li liquid water ice, depending on how high the how high the um, mountain is. So this is the new feature you should be looking for soon. I think it's going to vastly improve or increase the ways we can use the model. Okay, so uh, I want to finish off here with the next, with the last five minutes or so, um, with some discussion about CLM as a as a community modeling tool and in ways you can think about using CLM to advance your advance your science. And so, um, obviously, CLM can be coupled into the into CSM, and you can study all sorts of things like I've been discussing: land atmosphere interactions, climate variability, air quality and air chemistry. Sorry, air quality and atmosphere chemistry climate change, obviously, which is a key reason why we've been developing the model, but also you can use it to study uh, weather or seasonal prediction type things. Um, but it's also used a lot uh, as just on its own in land only mode, we call it. And also it's developed a lot by people who are more interested in, in, in details of, of facade dimensions or hydrology or ecology or biogeochemistry of the cryosphere. And so we have a very large interaction uh, set of interactions with a with a broad community of people who are interested in all these different features um, uh, and capability of CLM, which is really a synthesis uh, in, in in one way of looking at it of, of our understanding of of you know processes at land surface. And so we have a, a very active development community for CLM five. We had a lot of people involved, more than fifty researchers from fifteen different institutions were involved in the development of CLM five with a lot of focus on, on many things, including hydrology that is more consistent with our state of our understanding, more ecologically relevant plant, nutrient, water, carbon, water dynamics, uh, land management pra practices, including a global crop model, wood harvest and urban environments, and a prognostic Greenland ice sheet model, um, where the land is actually uh, being used to account for the surface mass balance as input to the, to the ice sheet model, which you'll hear about more later. Um, all these features and, and discussion of the improvements in the model are, are described in this overview paper. 
uh, which I recommend is if you're going to start trying to get into understanding CLM and using CLM. And then I'd like to finish off then with, with just some examples of how you can use CLM as a research tool, just uh, in terms of configurations, because it's pretty complicated as, again, all aspects of our system, model and modeling, modeling endeavor are. Um, CLM is no different. Um, in particular, you're going to need to make decisions about which configuration you want to use. And we have several out of the box configurations. The two main ones, or three main ones, are uh, SP, the satellite phenology, uh, where we have we prescribe our vegetation. Uh, and you compare that to BGC or BGC crop, where we are doing prognostic carbon and also prognostic vegetation state. And this is almost always the first question you need to ask is whether I want to use one of these three different versions. Because um, if you're doing something, for example, high resolution, uh, and you don't have the ability to spin up the model, the, the biogeochemistry model is, is quite time intensive to spin up and take hundreds of years. Um, we tend to recommend using the SP version, which can spin up uh, much more quickly. Um, but if you're interested in long-term uh, climate changes, or you're really interested in how vegetation uh, states interact with the climate, um, then you would want to use the BGC and the BGC crop version. We have a BGC noanthra version where we've uh, released for paleo climate studies, where we've sort of turned off all the human uh, aspects of the model in a way that it's easy for users so they don't have to really know too much about what's going on. And then there's fates. I think you'll be hearing more about that. Um, this is an ecosystem demography model, which is treating um, how plants are, are competing for resources, um, light, uh, energy, water, um, within the near system much more realistically and treating disturbance processes uh, like fire and wind throw much more realistically. Um, and that is uh, a new feature of the model, which is being used increasingly uh, by the community. Uh, and then there's also options to revert individual primarizations back. So if you have a particular question where you'd like to, to ask about, you know, is the sophistication of plant water use important? You can revert back to an older version of plant water use and compare it to a new modern version and, and study that. There's many different spatial configurations, global obviously, with when you're coupled to the CSM, um, but we also run the land model on its own uh, for regional configuration. You can go to higher resolution if you want, uh, regionally in land only mode, or also we run it at single points or tower sites. Um, and the land can be run on a regu irregular grids like a cube sphere, or regional refined, or also on a catchment grid uh, if, if that's what you need to do. Um, typically the land and the atmosphere are run on the same grid, uh, but there is capability within CSM for to run the land and atmosphere on their own grids. And this just shows graphically. There's also different modes of forcing, which I think are relevant. Um, there's what we call anomaly forcing for land only mode, where we where we apply monthly anomalies taken, for example, from a previous CSM simulation, and we add them to a cycle grid analysis product, which we tend to force the land model with. And this allows you to very efficiently run simulations uh, cheaply um, with climate change with just the land only. If you want to evaluate how a new parameterization, for example, affects soil moisture. You can you can do that without having to couple to the, to the whole system. Um, obviously, there's a situation where that is or is not an appropriate thing to do. Um, we have many different forcing data sets with a lot of uncertainty in what actually the historical climate has been. Um, so we use a, a range of forcing data sets to force the model. We have a, a prescribed soil moisture version if you want to do studies related to specifically related to soil moisture and how soil moisture is interacting with climate. Um, you can prescribe soil moisture states. Um, and there's different land use and land cover change data sets. And obviously, to state the obvious, you can couple it to CAM and CSM, and there's also a configuration we can couple to, to WARF. Um, and there's a data simulation capability. And then finally, um, you know, you can make decisions about complexity. You can reduce complexity by turning off various features of the system uh, or changing the, the structure of the surface, the soil structure, or the number of PFTs per grid cell. And there's also ways to increase complexity, like hill slopes, um, fates, which I've mentioned, trace gas emissions from fire, additional land management practices, flooding, and ozone damage to plants. So here are a few resources uh, if you want to get started with CLM. Um, the uh, web page, the, the code repository, uh, and also my overview paper. And then finally, I just want to finish off here with, with, uh, with some priorities and plans for the next generation CLM. Um, you know, the key questions, as I've sort of gone through several times now, Water and food security in the context of climate variability, change, and extreme weather, ecosystem vulnerability, and their impacts on the carbon cycle ecosystem services, 
source of their predictability from land processes and the impacts of land use and land use change on climate, carbon, water, and extremes. And to get to the answering these questions, we're doing things like introducing the hill slope model. Um, we are accounting for water and land management, for example, a reservoir primarization, um, treating the ecosystem demography with the FATES model, considering a multi-layer canopy to have more accurate representation of surface fluxes. And there's many other things that we're working on. And I will stop there and take any questions. <clears throat> and I apologize for not being there. It would have been fun to do this in person. Yes, Dave, you did an amazing job getting through. Like, uh, I know you've been struggling with COVID for like the last week. So thank you so much for pushing through and giving us this great, great talk. I'm going to open it up to um, the, the students now to uh, ask questions. And if, oh, thanks, Elizabeth. Elizabeth's just passing the mic around. So wait till you get the mic. And Hi. Yep. Hi. <clears throat> so I had a question about sort of how plant physiology is sort of parameterized in these models. Um, with these high emission scenarios like SSB5 and you're increasing CO2 the atmosphere and you're saturating it, my sense is that the plant's photosynthesis rates are going to be more efficient because you have more CO2. That's going to change the rate in which they release water through their stoma, right? And I was just wondering whether or not that's something that you have considered in these CLM models or whether that's even impactful or relevant for sort of surface land hydrology changes in the future. Can we put Dave yeah. on? Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we do uh, account for that within the parameterization in CLM and the photosynthesis and the model regulation parameterizations. And yes, we have found that it is important. Um, you can get very detectable impacts on, on the soil moisture availability, the soil water state, um, if you include these these uh, these feedbacks, and so um, what we do find is that uh, if you account for these processes, then the model it does lead to it does mitigate a little bit the um, the increase in water stress uh, uh, that you might get with a, with a simpler model model that's not accounting for this, like a PDSI or a, um, you know some of the more simple drought um, drought models or drought sort of statistical representation of the drought. Um, that said, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty in how strong that uh, interaction should be. And so a lot of research is done by our group and others around the community to try to understand whether or not the representation that we have is, is accurate. And that's actually quite difficult measurements to make is have to sort of indirect. Um, and so it's sort of an open question across the landline community about how strong that water use efficiency effect uh, will be in the real world. Thank you. Elizabeth, <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, I just had a question when you were talking about the representative hill slopes that is coming into fruition now. How does this impact runoff calculations? Just out of curiosity, like is that going to be accounted for more with the hill slopes? <clears throat> Well, what it does is um, it does affect runoff. And basically what it does is it allows water to move down a hill slope in a realistic way. So um, water that, that falls on the, you know, so the upland part or the higher part of the mountaintop um, will then, you know, flow down the column and then will move down from one, uh, the upper part of the hill slope down into the bottom part of the hill slope. And so what we find is that there's, um, you know, saturated zones near the riparian zone, near the rivers. Um, and it also affects then the timing. The water has to flow a longer way to get into the rivers. And so it will affect the timing of, of, of runoff. Additionally, because we're now accounting for, um, you know, better accounting for the elevation gradients across the grid cell, um, you know, those high elevation regions are, are getting more snow and they're keeping their snow longer. And so that snow, which might have melted in, you know, say in the Western US, it might have melted in the original CLM in, in April is now lasting in the May or June. And so that's also affecting the runoff because that water is, is uh, melting out uh, later in the season. And so then it has to filter down through the soil and come out. And so it's, it's um, we're hoping, we're still trying to validate exactly when and where this is making improvement, but um, it should improve the overall runoff uh, timing and probably also runoff amounts. Thank you so much. <clears throat> <clears throat> we might make this the last question so we can go to the break um, but um hi 
uh, this question is a uh, two part. Uh, what uh, processes do you think uh, we should focus on in order to reduce the internal variability in carbon cycle and which regions do you want more observation data to come and train the, the land models? Which regions are less represented? Yeah. Do you really mean intraannual variability or do you mean the long-term trends of carbon storage? Intraannual variability of carbon. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, well, what, what we found in, in CLM5 is that we've actually had, it's one of the features of CLM5 which got worse. Um, not too many features got worse, but this one did. The intraannual variability is weaker on the total net carbon exchange in CLM5 than it was in prior versions of the model. And we've been doing quite a bit of analysis on this to try and understand why. And this is kind of getting into the weeds and maybe I want to ask the next speaker, but um, it looks like there's actually a tighter sync up between the incoming carbon and the carbon that is respired. And so carbon that's coming in is then getting respired uh, out through decomposition processes more quickly. And so that actually leads to a decrease in the interannual variability um, because there's that because they've synced up. So in terms of what processes need to be represented, it's a little bit difficult to say what processes need to re be represented. One hypothesis, uh, which we are trying to test now, is that it's actually not that there's no more lack of process representation, is that they're the parameter values that we're using has somewhat coincidentally um, gotten these two processes to line up more tightly. And so we are exploring in a, another project that didn't get introduced a very large parameter uncertainty assessment and hopefully parameter calibration uh, process to try to see if there's a, a, parameter, a set of parameters that would actually produce a more realistic and trend of variability carbon. And so to answer your second question, really it's, it's the same as answer is that in terms of new observations, um, you know, I, I don't like to answer that because there's really so many observations which are useful and it's hard to know which ones are the ones that are gonna make the big difference. But what I can say is that you know, there's a lot of new observations that have been coming online through satellites and, and in situ observations over the last decade or so. And what we think we need to do is actually better use the, those existing observations. And so through this parameter estimation project, what, which we are doing now, um, we are trying to make better use of that huge and vast suite of, of uh, observations that we really have not been using as, as, uh, as well as we think we could have been uh, in the past. Great, thanks, Dave. And uh, okay. as, as David mentioned, we're, the next the next talk we'll have will be Will Weeder, and uh, we'll be looking at the carbon cycle in the land model. So we can answer a lot of those sorts of questions. Um, <coughs> thanks, everyone. Uh, I know we started a little late, so I'm I'm going to reschedule the break. So we're going to come back at ten past uh, nine. Um, we'll just basically take a little bit of time out of lunch to like make up for that. Uh, but thank you, Dave. Thanks a lot for for coming in and being able to pre present this. Like. Uh, from from home we really appreciate it and uh yeah everyone there's coffee outside and we'll see you back at 10 past great thank you